What a great time to be a Giant, be a fan of the Giants. But we have something going here. We're building something special, and you know you can see it from the outside and inside. It's even more beautiful. Reflecting on everything that got me here, just to see that uniform, and you know I, I watched. That's the team I watched the most growing up. My dad was a Giants fan, so once a Giant, always a Giant. For me, it's only a Giant. Welcome everybody to another edition of All In with Art Stapleton, a New York Giants podcast brought to you by NorthJersey.com and The Record. I'm your host, Art Stapleton, and it is DeVito time and Big D. It's been a very busy week for the New York Giants, and for most of it, it hasn't been a great week for the Giants. You're sitting at two and seven. You're getting ready for the rematch from opening night with the Dallas Cowboys. Daniel Jones officially suffers a torn ACL in his right knee. He is out for the season and staring at a extended recovery time, which will prove to be grueling, I'm sure, and will leave his status for the 2024 season with the Giants in doubt. The season itself, it's hard looking at the schedule and picking out a game that the Giants will be favored, let alone have the opportunity to win without Daniel Jones and Tyrod Taylor, who has a ribcage injury that landed him on injured reserve last weekend. Actually talked to Tyrod today briefly, and he does not believe it is a season-ending injury. Uh, but obviously that will be determined three games from now after the Giants buy when they reassess and see where they're at in, at quarterback. So 16 and a half point underdogs at Jerry World this Sunday. It's always a fun time heading to Arlington, Texas, the home of the World Series champions, Texas Rangers, right down the street. And, you know, look, Tommy DeVito as quarterback, as Brian Dable said when I asked him about it on Thursday, he said DeVito brought a little juice to practice. The Giants need that right now. But as I wrote in a column coming back from Las Vegas is that the Giants needed to put DeVito at quarterback this week. And I'll tell you why. It's not as much a talent question. Although I do think DeVito has some talent as a developmental prospect. Yes, he's from North Jersey. So am I. He's from Cedar Grove. I'm from Rochelle Park. We've got that Jersey connection. Yes, for years I covered high schools for the Bergen Record and NorthJersey.com. I was behind the name of Varsity Aces, which is our high school Twitter account and used to be our high school blog. Those guys are the Varsity Aces now. I was an original Varsity Ace with Darren Cooper, who is still there, and Dan Rosen, who was also a good friend of ours, is now at NHL.com. So I covered a ton of Don Bosco. Essentially, I was a Don Bosco pseudo beat writer for years. And Tommy DeVito comes from Don Bosco. So I've been on the Tommy DeVito story from the moment he signed with the Giants as an undrafted free agent back in the spring. And I can tell you, Tommy DeVito never imagined being in this position this soon. And at this point, you have to credit a twist of fate with the injuries to Jones and to Taylor. You have to give Tommy DeVito credit for how hard he worked just to make this roster as an undrafted free agent. And when I say roster, I mean the practice squad. And now the locker room looks at a 25-year-old undrafted free agent and has respect for him. He's one of them. And as I wrote in our column on Monday, the Giants had to play Tommy DeVito. Yes, they went out and they signed Jacob Eason, who was here in the spring as a tryout at the veteran minicamp in June. They signed him to the practice squad. He's another arm here. Yes, Matt Barkley was promoted from the practice squad 
to the active roster. He's a veteran, 33 years old, has much more experience than Tommy DeVito does. When you consider Tommy DeVito essentially has two games worth, or really one game worth, uh, when you it's about five and a half quarters that DeVito has played. You know, but there are some things that you have to consider when you're watching DeVito. And we'll have more on DeVito on our game day podcast Sunday morning. I have an exclusive interview with Tommy, getting him primed for the game. Uh, so I think you'll enjoy that. I'll also have another story on DeVito. Uh, we had two today. Not only DeVito being named the starter, but kind of a behind the scenes look from those who have known DeVito throughout his journey from Don Bosco in New Jersey to the Giants. Uh, so hopefully you guys check that out at NorthJersey.com. And the DeVito question brings up another aspect of this, and that's what's next. The Giants are in contention right now for the number one overall pick. According to Tankathon, they're fourth. Depending on what happens in Thursday night's game with the Carolina Panthers and the Chicago Bears, the Giants could move up to third. It's more than likely that they will because both teams are ahead of them in draft order right now. And it just so happens that the Bears own the Panthers' pick after selling off the draft pick last year that allowed Carolina to draft Bryce Young. The reason I'm talking about this is because I think last year Joe Shane anticipated being in this position and the Giants overachieved and they made the playoffs. And you can't take that away from this team and Brian Dable's first season. And they won a playoff game on the road and everything they accomplished, they accomplished. But in year two, I think they're a lot closer to what everyone expected them to be in year one. So the QB talk picks up now. This weekend, you've got Caleb Williams playing at number six, Oregon. You've got Drake May playing Saturday night in a Tobacco Road rivalry against the Duke Blue Devils. That's where it stops for the quest right now for the Giants. Sure, there are going to be other quarterbacks to consider, but to me, the best guest I could have had on today's show to talk about the college prospects, I was fortunate enough to get him to join me, and that's Jordan Reed from ESPN. And if you've listened to this show from the start of it, which is now three years plus, Jordan Reed is always one of my favorite guests to have because he's no BS. He's not saying things to try to get attention. He looks at things from a scouting perspective. He knows what he's talking about, and he's honest, and he doesn't look to blow smoke. And I think you're really going to love this segment today with Jordan Reed. So after our interview, I will come back with a couple final thoughts and then obviously preview again Sunday's game day podcast. We may get it up tomorrow, uh, Saturday night with Tommy DeVito joining me one-on-one. Uh, but that's the other quarterback issue. Right now, it's about the potential quarterback of the future. Let's get to my conversation with Jordan Reed about what the future may hold for the New York Giants next April. So let's jump right in with this, Jordan. Compare the quarterback class for this year to what we've seen over the last couple of years when you got you and I have gotten together at the Combine and talked various positions regarding the Giants. But uh, there's been a lot of hype so far for the quarterbacks that are available. Where do you see this class kind of fitting in? Well, there's uh, two obvious guys at the top. And I'll just start with Caleb Williams of USC, who is still my quarterback one at the moment. And then also Drake May of North Carolina. Those would be the two guys that you see at the top. But I think when you're talking about putting both of those guys on the pedestal in this draft class, I think it's it's a clear 1A and 1B between those guys. And depending on who you talk to, they have a preference as far as who they see as that 1A or 
you know, the one B in this class for me right now it still is Caleb Williams. But, I mean, with Caleb, you get everything in the position. He can play inside of the pocket. He can play outside of the pocket. He's just a wizard. Everything that he does is just so natural to him. And even though USC hasn't had a season that they had envisioned, you still see the traits with Caleb. Um, he has everything that you want in position, like I said. And then with Drake May, <clears throat> he's gotten better every single week of the season, in my opinion. And a lot of people kind of saw him a little bit behind Caleb Williams coming to the year. But now I think that margin is, uh, that gap is closed a little bit more than what people are saying right now. So with Drake, though, he comes from a background of athletes. Dad was a very successful player in North Carolina. Um, his brother was a national championship basketball player in North Carolina, too. He also has a brother. I think play baseball at yeah. Florida. So he comes from a family of athletes. Um, something that a lot of people don't really know about Drake is that he actually was coached by Josh McCown his final year oh, wow. uh, of high school, his final year of high school in Charlotte, North Carolina. So he has a lot of experience and he's been taught by some really good coaches throughout his career, but he did have to sit for two years. So with uh, he, he backed up Sam Howe for a year, obviously, and I think he lost his senior year of high school in co for COVID. So uh, what he's really been doing over these past few seasons has really been phenomenal, especially with him missing those two seasons back to back. So he's still really learning the position. I think that's why there's so much intrigue with Drake May right now. But he's one player that I think is going to get even more buzz as the season pre-draft process goes along. You're already seeing it uh, with him potentially being a number one overall pick candidate. How do you, when you talk the overall class, I mean, obviously the two legit guys at the top, but – you know, I've heard people say this. Well, if this is a year that you need a quarterback, it's a good year to need a quarterback. Um, how do you feel about depth guys like J.J. McCarthy and Michael Penix and uh, some of the other guys? I know Bo Nix has been thrown out there. Is it kind of hard to measure that group against the two top guys in the group? I think the top two guys are solidified, in my opinion. Like yeah. I said, I think they're on a pedestal or they're in a tier of their own. But right. That, depending on who you talk to. <laughs> There's various opinions. I mean, we still have Shador Sanders at Colorado. I don't think we'll see him until 2025. But after that, it's a mixed bag as far as who you like. It could be J.J. McCarthy at Michigan. It could be Michael Penix um, at Washington, even Bo Nix uh, at Oregon. And also a guy who's surging this season is Jaden Daniels of LSU. He's had a phenomenal year this year. So it's still kind of TBD with a lot of guys. And I say TBD just because J.J. McCarthy's season it's really actually beginning this week just because Michigan hasn't had a high quality of only he has Penn State and Ohio State over the next two or three two out of three games. So it's still kind of TBD as far as the picking order with those guys. But if I had to say who would be QB three right now for me, with Shador Sanders not coming out until twenty twenty five, and that's just my opinion, it would be JJ McCarthy of Michigan. Yeah, you know, when when uh Shador Sanders coach doubles as his father and says he's not coming out or essentially hints at that, we probably should take that as face value, right? <laughs> yeah, I would think so. <laughs> so tell me, I mean, you know this situation here with the Giants. I mean, they certainly did not go into this season expecting uh, to potentially be in the position that right now they're headed for. I mean, being slated, you know, in the top five right now, and who knows, you know, starting Tommy DeVito this weekend, undrafted free agent from Jersey, uh, at the Cowboys, no less, a team that beat them 40 to nothing. Um, you know, so the Giants could right be, be right in this mix. You know this system. You know Brian Dable. You know Mike Kafka, provided Kafka stays on after the year. Uh, when you look at the two top two guys, if it's Caleb or if it's Drake, uh, do you think one over the other fits in this kind of system? Or, of course, the big bad New York uh, profile – of being able to play quarterback in New York, do you would you have a preference right now between one or the other? I think when you're talking about just the Giants in general, there's so many factors that you have to factor in, whether it's the media presence of who can actually handle all the factors or all the outside variables that come with playing the position there. And then, of course, you have to factor in the scheme fit as well. But I think with the scheme, I don't think you could go wrong with either one, honestly, just because they're so special at the position. But if I think one fits better, than the other in Kafka's, Kafka's system. I think Drake May would be the better fit just because of some of the things that he's shown and what he's able to do and what he's trying to do. This year offensively, I think Drake May would be a better fit for what they're trying to do. But Caleb Williams, I mean, he's a special talent as well. So he's one of those quarterbacks that can fit any system, in my opinion. But if we're just aligning the traits with some of the things that Kafka is trying to do, I think Drake May would be a better overall fit for just what they're trying to do. 
schematically. You know, it's interesting. This weekend is certainly shaping up. You obviously mentioned J.J. McCarthy going at, you know, at Penn State. Uh, Caleb has to play at number six, Oregon. You know, Drake has the Duke-UNC game on, on Saturday night, which doesn't necessarily attach the national rankings. But, you know, Duke at UNC would imagine a crowd would be a little hyped, even if it's only football compared to hoops. And then uh, I mentioned Penix. Uh, who has to play Utah. So, you know, Penix had the stage last week with Caleb. Um, how much when you go into your weekend, and I know you're not just focused on the quarterbacks, but, you know, I try to get a scout's perspective in terms of, you know, we make such a big deal. Uh, the general manager, Joe Shane, and the front office are at Washington, USC. So they're clearly, you know, have at least one eye on the quarterbacks. From your perspective, when you talk to scouts and talk to people in the front office, um, how does a weekend break down like this where, you know, do you look at matchups and see where teams from an NFL perspective are matched up? You know, oh, well, if this guy's going to watch Drake instead of Caleb, you know, and vice versa. I mean, Joe Shane has seen both multiple times this year. So um, I'm just curious from your perspective when you when you talk to guys what the whole weekend shapes out to be. Yeah, and that's a great question just because you hear – where you see all these tweets or reports about Joe Shane being here or a certain scout or Brandon Brown being somewhere at a certain game. Whenever multiple representatives show up at a game, it's a very big deal. And we'll never know who they're there for. And that's not to say that they're not there for the quarterback, but there could be other prospects that they could be there for. There's a ton of scouts on Michigan. There's a lot of guys on USC and North Carolina has a couple of guys that are coming out this year too. So that's not just to say that they're there for the quarterback, but whenever multiple representatives from a team show up at a game, it is a very big deal just because, and this is the best way that I can actually break down scouting to people. It's kind of like buying a car. You can look online, you can watch the film, you can see the outside of the car. But once you get up close to it, this is where live scouting comes into hand. You can see the inside of the car, you can see the makeup, you can get in the engine of it too. So how they prep for games, let's say Drake May throws a pick six. How does he respond after that? You can't see what he's doing on the sideline from the TV copy. But when you're at those games, you can see how he bounces back from adversity. Is he going on? Is he running to the sideline to get on the headset with the offensive coordinator? Or is he just alienating himself at the other end of the bench away from his teammates? So little things like that and those little uh, mannerisms and postures are things that front offices look for. And that's why live scouting is so important just because with these quarterbacks, I mean, it can make and break your front office. And we've already seen that around the league. And if you get this wrong, this could be your downward spiral and potentially being fired. So this is a big decision upcoming for the Giants if they do decide to go quarterback. You know, it, it's funny. The other timeline thing is always interesting, right? I mean, it, you, you always hope that when you're looking for a specific position, especially quarterback, the timeline matches up with where you're at. And I think a year ago, before the season began, uh, you know, with Daniel Jones' fifth-year option declined, you know, the idea that Joe Shane and Brian Dable were coming in here, you know, and starting off fresh, I think there was this feeling that what's happening this season would have happened last season, and they would have been in the mix for C.J. Stroud or Bryce Young, uh, and the way that would have panned out. Um, so if you, from your perspective, it's a year later, um, I'm going to put you on the spot. Now, obviously, it's easy that C.J. Stroud is lighting it up. And, you know, Bryce has had his little struggles, but two weeks ago he had his best game as a pro. Um, if you had to compare in your rankings C.J. and Bryce up against Caleb and Drake, if you need a quarterback, a franchise guy, are you better off having got one last year or do you think this year has a little bit more upside? How do you compare and contrast? Well, it's tough to say. I mean, just because, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. Even if you like C.J. Stroud, I don't think anybody saw him going on immediate, having the immediate success that he's having already. But I think both of these guys that are at the top of the draft, they're better than both of the guys that we saw last year. And I firmly believe that they both have graded higher for me than Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud. And that, that's just not to say that these are the two latest quarterbacks in the rankings. Um, I, I mean, I firmly believe that both of them are better prospects than both of the guys coming out. But... I mean, it's tough for the Giants, honestly, Art, right, just because they were in a tough situation last year with Daniel Jones having such a breakout year. Um, I honestly would have franchise tagged him, but then you would have went on to lose Saquon if they didn't want to sign him to a long-term deal. So they kind of were in a pickle of where they didn't want to lose either one by using that franchise tag. But I would have used the franchise tag on Daniel Jones, and I would have let Saquon go. But, I mean, you take a guy with a high pick, even though 
do was in this regime, regime Gettleman did it, but with them having such a great year last year, I just think it would have been such a bad look for them, especially if he even went on to have success elsewhere. Yep. And that's why I think they were in sort of a pickle there of where they couldn't lose either one. So they ended up franchise tagging. Of course, they wanted to work out a deal with him, and then they gave Daniel Jones the four-year deal. So it was a tough situation for them to be in. When you look, I saw a couple of your tweets off of the USC uh, Washington game from last week. I wanted to ask you about obviously, you know, watching Caleb after the game and his emotions, uh, you know, on the sideline and just really be, it seemed being broken up by, you know, the idea that they lost another game in that situation. Um, but from, from a Caleb perspective, um, what do you see? What did you see last week, uh, from him and, what are the, I don't want to say concerns, but what are the kind of check marks that he needs to hit, do you think, over the rest of this season and then going into the offseason to kind of solidify himself as 1 or 1A one versus 1B with May? Yeah, the clip was, uh, it was overblown to me, honestly, and I think people reacted to it in a really weird way, in my opinion. And we're judging these 20, 21 year old kids. I call them kids just because they're so young coming yep. to the NFL. But me personally, I took it as a positive, honestly, or just because it showed that he cared. Now, if he went out there and threw three or four interceptions and he just kept his arm folded and powdered on the sideline like he didn't care, now we would have something to talk about. But him going up to the stands into his mom's arm and him crying, that showed to me that he cared a lot about what he was doing. And even after the game, he talked about. He didn't envision losing three games this year just because he's never been to a Pac-12 championship game and he's never been to uh, the college football playoff either. So if this is something that really hurt to him. So it mattered to me a lot. And, you know, everybody's going to say, how is he going to survive in New York media? But with Caleb, and if you ever hear Caleb talk, he's kind of one of those dudes that really embraces the spotlight. And that's the type of player that I want entering New York media just because not only are you playing quarterback, but you have to have tough skin too just because – I mean, you're a part of it. You guys are going to eat him alive <laughs> if he doesn't play well. But also, if he does play well, he still has to be willing to embrace that spotlight, too. So, and I think Caleb has that type of star potential and that type of personality of where he would embrace it, and then he would try to run with it, too. With the spotlight, uh, it, are there questions about about Drake, and, and are you almost anticipating what his scouting season is going to be like? Because that seems like... The spotlight is on him enough right now at North Carolina, but we know UNC is not playing in a, you know, uh, probably not going to be in a New Year's Day Bowl situation or being in the playoffs. So Caleb has obviously been in the spotlight uh, with everything he's done in his career to this point. Does Drake have to show that, do you think? Uh, we know what the skill looks like, but the idea of the personality to kind of fit at the top of the draft that way uh, and when you get to the next level, being able to handle that kind of situation. You know, I've been around Drake a couple games this year, been on the sideline, been studying him a lot. He's kind of one of those even kill dudes. And it's not like in a Daniel Jones sense of where he doesn't show a whole bunch of personality. It's kind of more so like a Jalen Hurts of where he never gets too high or too low. He does show some emotion in big moments in games, but he's one of those dudes that just stays level-headed and even kill a lot of time. And even listening to him post-game and even before games as well, he's one of those dudes that never gets too high or too low. So I think he has the personality definitely to handle the situation in New York, but he's just one of those guys that is not ever going to show a whole bunch of emotion, even when things go good or bad. Which is kind of funny because that's always what the Giants, you know, say they want. At least ownership loves that. Uh, but I still think uh, that kind of personality from – from Caleb would be uh, would be very electric and kind of give this you know franchise a spark. Knowing next year you have the Daniel Jones questions coming back from the knee, and you know they have their out in the contract for the following year, and who knows if Saquon's going to be back. It's almost like a reset, um, you know. And I really think that the ownership is going not ownership, but the front office is going to want uh, you know their Josh Allen. I mean that that's pretty much what. I think they're looking at, and they hope Daniel Jones could have been that, but obviously for all a bunch of factors this year that hasn't played out. Um, so for the, you know, for the remainder of this next couple months, I mean, is there anything that your top two guys do you think could do uh, to leapfrog one another? You know, are you what are you looking at now? I mean, I know you, you know, you're great at, you know, looking at it from a scouting eye, and you see the traits. 
But in terms of what they do on the field or show in the scouting evaluations in the offseason, um, is there anything that you can envision these two guys, other than something you know that's unforeseen as far as off the field goes, uh, that would kind of change your opinion of these guys? Or are they just so locked in on that pedestal that that you're, you're convinced that these are the two guys that are going to be at the top of that draft uh, come April? Yeah, I mean, there's still a long way to go throughout the process, and there's plenty of other things to happen. We still have the combine. We have um, championship game season. So there's a lot of things that factor into it. You're looking at how they finish the season. Now with Caleb out of uh, postseason play, in a sense, he can't go to the Pac-12 title game. They can't go to the college football playoff. That's pretty much eliminated for them now with three wins. How do they finish? North Carolina is still in contention for the ACC title game, so we're going to be able to see Drake May again in a big moment. And then, of course, if they end up playing, in the bowl games, that's something that's going to be factored into the equation as well. And then we have the combine. And we know the theatrics that come with playing in yeah. the combine or participating in the combine, too. So there's still a long way to go, and there's a lot leading up to the process. But also, there's so many different things that are factored into the equation now. We have juniors that can play right. in all-star games. So do, do we get a situation of where Caleb Williams or Drake May ends up playing in the senior bowl? So there's so many different factors that factor into the equation. So we're pretty much on about... I would say step two of the step four process that's happening right now, but we still have a long way to go. Last one from from me, and I really do appreciate your time. Uh, we mentioned J.J. McCarthy getting to play Penn State and then Ohio State. Do you see kind of a wave coming if he plays well in those two situations, especially in the Ohio State game? Uh, we know how guys can kind of catch a wave, catch a hype wave a little bit. Can McCarthy come anywhere close to those top two guys and be in some teams' contention, uh, or is it really a clear distinction between the top two and then everybody else? Hello? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay, yep. I couldn't hear you. Were you talking about Sorry. Can you yeah, that? of course, no, of course. Oh, sorry. Uh, final thing would be just the idea of we. You mentioned McCarthy earlier, and we know the next two games uh, with Penn State, and then they have Ohio State. We know the high-profile games. They're obviously, you know, Michigan in the hunt for a national title. We know how the hype wave can work. It doesn't necessarily work in the scouting community, but from your perspective. What McCarthy does in those games, can that give him a boost to not only solidify QB3 in this, but kind of convince some teams that maybe he's a guy that deserves a look um, alongside the top two guys that we've already talked about being locked in on that pedestal? Oh, without question. I think these last two out of three games for J.J. McCarthy, are going to be weighted more than what he's shown this season just because he has to go into Penn State and get a win, and then also Ohio State. So those are the two quality opponents on the schedule. And then, of course, after that, you have postseason play, and then how does he look going to the college football playoff if they're able to make it there? He wasn't very good at all in the college football playoff. They end up losing to TCU. In the semifinals last year, end up throwing two pick sixes. So he has a chance to rebound and redeem himself, and he has looked better this year. They've been more reliant on him in the passing game. I thought Harbaugh held his hand a little bit last year just because he was a first-year starter. And then he was only 19 years old still. He just turned 20 years old this year. So still a very young starter. But as far as the traits, I think he has it all to eventually end up being a top 15 pick. Now, does he push himself into that top 10 contention? I think that all hinges on what he shows during the back half of the season. All right, I lied. I said one. I said last question, but this is my last one for you. Uh, you're, you're Joe Shane, you're John Mara, you're Brian Dable. System aside, you've got to pull the trigger if this team is in position. I understand it's a long way to go, but who is Jordan Reed taking for the Giants? Is it Caleb Williams or is it Drake May? So my bold prediction was not really bold. Considering the circumstances, I don't think the Giants are going to win another game this year, and I think they're going to end up with the number one overall pick. And I would take Caleb Williams of USC. Um, he's been my quarterback one since the summer. I just think the traits that you get with Caleb from an arm talent perspective, his mobility, um, his knowledge of the game, his football IQ, I just think he's ready from day one to be a starter, and he has that personality to embrace the spotlight, and I think he has the toughness to be able to handle it. And I know everybody's going to say, 
or bring up the video of him crying to his mom. But like I said earlier, that just shows to me that he cares. But I think he has the tough skin. He has the ability uh, to eventually be a plus starter. Now, I'm not going to say he's going to tear the league up right away like what C.J. Stroud is doing. But eventually, two to three years from now, I think you're going to feel very good about taking him with the number one overall pick. I think it's a very important point, and I think you made it to me at the Combine a couple of years ago when we talked about Kayvon Thibodeau, is that traits aside, there had to be a front office that was willing to take the personality and the the spotlight uh, with that came with Thibodeau. And the Giants obviously were willing to do that. I think they would be willing to do it with Caleb as well. So I do agree with you. Jordan Reed, as always, always a pleasure, man. Appreciate all your help all the time. Thanks as always, Art. So my special thanks to Jordan Reed for joining me. Also check out my story on NorthJersey.com about the quarterbacks. Kind of a weekend guide to the quarterbacks. Where you could find them, will it be on TV? If you're Giants fans, if you're a true Giant fan listening to this show, who's all in, I know you're still watching Sunday's game. I know you want to watch this game. There are always things to watch. So for all those who say they're not going to watch the Giants this weekend, enjoy your weekend. But I, I know there are a lot of people who will watch this game and watch for certain players, watch for things, and certainly watch for Tommy DeVito. We don't know what's going to happen between now and the rest of the season. We don't know if the Giants are going to be in the top two within striking distance of one of these quarterbacks. But I will say, I understand the commitment to Daniel Jones. I was behind the commitment to Daniel Jones after last season. But the contract is what it is. And it's two years and then a decision to be made. And the decision to be made involves dead money in the third year. But the circumstances will force the Giants' hand one way or the other. And when Daniel Jones suffered his neck injury... There was certainly at that point reason to believe that the Giants might have to consider making a move. Now that Daniel Jones has torn his ACL, this is not about slamming Daniel Jones. If you've read my coverage since I've been on the beat and you've listened to this podcast, I've been nothing but fair to Daniel Jones. Uh, I believe I've been critical where I've needed to be critical. And the bottom line is... If you're in position to take one of these quarterbacks, and you heard Jordan say it, if you compare C.J. Stroud and Bryce Young to Drake May and Caleb Williams, this year's class at the top is better than last year's class. And I have no doubt that the Giants would have taken C.J. Stroud last year. That, that to me, from everything that I had heard, that would have been the quarterback that they were leaning towards. Now, granted, it never became something that the Giants seriously had to consider. Because once Daniel Jones showed his high point last year, the Giants believed they were going to commit to him. Because their options, they were in the 20s picking, they weren't going to get one of those quarterbacks. So at that point, it wasn't even worth discussing what they were going to do with the quarterback situation. This year certainly looks like it'll be a different story. I mean, you're 16 and a half point underdogs going to Dallas against a team you lost 40 to nothing with, uh, to, with your third string undrafted free agent rookie quarterback. And nobody played well last week. Maybe except for DeVito late. DeVito and Wandell Robinson. So, you know, that's the reality at this point. And if you're avoiding to discuss that reality because you don't want to hurt Daniel Jones's feelings or you feel like you, you need to worry about, you know, well, you know, I don't want to slight Daniel Jones at the least. And, uh, you know, all that stuff, all that stuff doesn't matter. This is a reality based business and a results based business. And if the Giants are in position to draft a quarterback, you can bet they are going to draft one of these two quarterbacks. Now, what they do over the last eight games, that's going to determine if they're in position to take one of these quarterbacks. And we'll be following it all through the year, through the rest of the year, and 
if they start winning games, well, then less of a focus will be placed on these quarterbacks because then the Giants will not be in contention to get one of the quarterbacks. But I don't have a magic eight ball. I don't have a crystal ball, as Brian Dable said two weeks ago. Whatever happens at this point, we're going to follow it. We're going to watch it. We're going to talk about it. We're going to analyze it. But predicting it, you can't be in the business of predicting when you're trying to figure out the NFL and especially not the Giants. Because the last two years, they've gone completely against what my predictions were. Maybe that makes me clueless if you want to take a dig. Or maybe that just shows how unpredictable the NFL can be, especially when you're covering a team that's trying to rebuild something from really what's been an awful, awful run for more than a decade. That'll wrap up today's show. Again, thanks to Jordan Reed for joining me, and we will have Jordan again on the podcast, hopefully come combine time Uh, but I really appreciated him kind of giving you a primer and what to expect as you start really digging into these quarterbacks I thought he gave you a great look at what to expect from Caleb Williams and Drake May and then obviously we will see if J.J. McCarthy from Michigan could jump into that group I don't believe McCarthy will but you just never know you never know how these things uh, play out So thanks to everyone for listening, for always being all in. And we are all in. We will be in Arlington, the home of the World Series champions, at Jerry World, one of my favorite stadiums in the league. It's hard not to like the Dallas Stadium. And we'll have more from Tommy DeVito on our game day podcast. So make sure you check that out and keep checking in on NorthJersey.com. This is a time of year where I need you. I need you guys to be committed to our coverage. Everyone who has subscribed to our coverage, much appreciated. Please continue to do so. Please continue to be engaged. Art at underscore Stapleton or at art underscore Stapleton. I'll get that right. But we are all in because of you. And we didn't anticipate a season like this, but we certainly appreciate your engagement. So keep reading, keep clicking, keep listening. And we'll be there for you, the Giants fan, every step of the way. We'll talk to you on game day Sunday from Arlington.